the members of the audience who are perhaps not so familiar with you, would you mind introducing your role, KCR, and talking about your role as Chief Technology Officer for me? My role is twofold. I'm responsible for IT, which is unusual in my career, because I'm responsible for meaning laptops and mobile phones, but my, I suppose my principal role <coughs> is uh, being responsible for the clinical research technologies that we use, uh, including Viva um, but other technologies as well, just to create the complete framework of software um, uh, to support the life cycle of clinical trials at KCR. And without giving away either of our ages, I mean, you've been in clinical trials now, shall I say 20 years? Is that uh, a good? It's actually a bit longer than that. My first I'm just being polite, you know. Yeah, so. my first clinical trial was in the 80s, actually, for my father, who was a heart surgeon. Um, and that was developing a Apple Macintosh-based system uh, oh. before I knew what a clinical trial was. Yeah. Um, but full-time since 1996. Okay. So I uh, get involved in uh, working for a company called by IBM. Uh, we work in a CTMS system, and then it become an EDC system. And back then, of course, the paper was still king. So yeah. we were doing clinical trials, there were new systems emerging, um, but there were still these questions as to why would we not want to use paper, why should we use electronic data capture. Nowadays it's a no-brainer, um, but in these days it was still a question mark. Um, and so you, things obviously evolved since then. I've been involved in the sort of development and implementation of technologies since then. So along that journey of you know going from paper to EDC. Do you think we've come as far as the potential would allow us for EDC? No, I think we can go a lot further. I mean, EDC, to some degree, is still a representation of the paper CRF, and I think we can we can move forward from that. You know, there's no requirement like there was in the past to say everything must be described in a paper form and then put in the screen. Um, I think uh, what people are trying to do when they're carrying out, cli carrying out clinical trials is they're trying to to prove efficacy and safety, um, typically, and uh, to do that they need data. Um, and EDC, as it's been evolved into, is just uh, almost a legacy definition of one element of the data that you're going to capture. So you don't have to have EDC, um, but obviously you know it's entrenched to some degree, and so um, selling a, a software product to run a clinical trial, not calling an EDC system, is almost suicide. But things will evolve away from that because it's not necessarily needed in the same way. How would you like to see us, as an industry, not just Viva, but shift our approach for data management? I mean, I think I would like to see things simplified. You know the. I mean, we've almost gone f through a curve where we started with paper and and we have thrown more and more technology at the problem, and we've created a problem in itself. Uh, we've created a avalanche of systems that are chucked at the uh, staff, um, very often the sites, um, and then we're scratching our heads saying, why are sites unhappy, or uh, why are trials not maybe as efficient as they could be? Um, to me, it's it's time to change that and say, no, let's simplify. Let's not make things more complicated than they need to be. Um, and the idea of best of breed interface separate systems, I really want to kill off. Um, and I think platform-based solutions will, you know, it's, it's one of these difficult things as a, a platform developer, and I can speak from some experience, is that to begin with, you know, things are maybe quite lightweight, but you're building on layers. You're building and building and building. And, you know, that platform capability that you're building just gets better and better. And all the systems you've developed on top of that all inherit this improvement in functionality and capability. Um, so I mean, the idea of best of breed, I think at some point in time, platform systems like Viva will be best of breed in all the verticals. Yep. Um, and it won't be a case of, you know, we have to compromise to, to use a platform. I don't think that's the case. And we're already seeing it with some of the, uh, the new improvements coming in. So let me take that a little bit further then, Doug. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about technology in the path there and your personal experience. What about the journey of data managers? You know, how are KCR yourself? How are you viewing the role of the data manager? Is it data scientist? Is it something in between? What's your vision for data management in the future? I think data managers have to be looking at a broader scope of data and also have to be looking at the whole life cycle of data. 
Uh, I've been a strong advocate of joining the two ends. So you've got building a study at the front end um, and you've got the you know processing of the data at the other end and they tended to be chucked into silos which meant the biostats people, the SAS programmers, were picking up the dirty <laughs> mess that the data managers originally were creating. And I don't think that's necessary anymore. Um, I think we can say, actually, if I do this at the outset, this will make life easier on, on the delivery. Um, but that also applies to things like, like you know, producing dashboards and reports. If you're sitting down preparing some forms and you're not thinking about how that information is going to be presented to a sponsor in a usable format, then you're just digging a hole for your team, your, your wider team. So I think data managers will be of greater involvement in the whole life cycle and they, I think they should be more involved. They should be looking at the bigger picture. Yeah. Um, I think there will still be the place for a data manager cleaning data. Um, but I do see that more of a separation. I think the data manager that's cleaning data you know, they can't do everything in the, in the world. You know, they, they will be doing the data cleaning, but that might be a, an early point to step up into um, more defining what the data is and administering the data and so on. So I think it will diversify um, to cover all the types of data and the, the data manager role will become more niche in, in key areas, but working to a common, common yeah. goal. But I think that's a continuation, is it? Because I remember when EDC first came along, I, I was in countless meetings where we talked about the change between the CRA and data managers. Mm -hmm. At one point it was data management was going to go away. Mm -hmm. And then it was, well, actually the DMs need to do more with the sites because mm -hmm. they're now the primary point mm -hmm. of contact. You, know, you mentioned paper at the beginning. I'm guessing on average in the paper world, as a data manager, I saw the data six to 12 weeks after the visit. So the relationship has completely changed. Um, and I think what you're describing is, is quite right. There's a continuation of the change. But actually, I still come back to this is a good time to be a data manager mm. because there's more trials going on than ever before. Mm. We're at the forefront of technology, and now the regulators under E8 mm. are saying data management needs to be involved in day one. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot of reason for us to think about how as data managers we can use technology but also shape technology. I think it's really important because previously process was something that was locked or in an SOP and the SOP was interpreted by individuals who then executed on it. What's changing is these processes are going into the systems. So someone has to set up these systems to say what these processes are. And you know, my dream world is in 10 years time or maybe longer is that instead of sitting down in front of Microsoft Word and typing up your SOP, you sit down into a process development tool and that defines the, the steps, the transitions, the roles of people working on it to go from the beginning of your study to the end of your study. Yeah. Um, and that will then effectively create not just a piece of paper that you read and understand and then follow, it will be something that has got a degree of intelligence. I, you know, I don't like the term machine learning and artificial intelligence, but there is a degree of, yeah. of teaching the computer, this is the life cycle of a clinical trial, and that once you've taught it, press start, and yeah. then it helps govern the life cycle for you. But I think that I mean, would be very clever, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it's almost a, a protocol-guided mm. training solution, a protocol-guided execution manual. You could see how all the historical documents we've created of the how-to, mm. um, from SOPs to work instructions to study specifics, mm if you could collapse all of those mm. and, and link it to a trial design, yep. I mean, you would make so much, you'd make huge yeah. efficiency gains. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of oversight that, that is happening because that is lacking, yeah. you know, and I, I don't think we, we, we don't know whether we don't need the oversight, but we can automate some of the events in that oversight. Yep. Some of the principles of electronic data capture, you know, we should have far more rich electronic forms <coughs> across the, the board for, you know, you shouldn't have temperature tech lists, for example, in the same way that you, you've had and you still have today. Um, so there's lots of forms that are filled out more as Word documents that should be filled out electronic forms that have their life cycle. Um, and if you get that into the electronic world, then of course you can then surface this data and you start to, to clean it and check it in the same way you see it with EDC data. Yeah. So if we think about taking that further, so the, the, the buzzword of the day is digital trials, decentralized trials. You and I have traded opinions on that online. 
Uh, generally fully in agreement, I mm -hmm. should quickly add. But how do you see that impacting things now? And, and maybe if I can stretch that to one other question, is how are KCR and yourself developing mm. ideas to stay ahead mm. of that direction of digital trials, more complex clinical trials? Yeah, so I, I think um, it's really that the use of technology and bringing it in as part of day-to-day -day work. You know, so you know w one of the th one of the telltale signs of an organisation that does hasn't really fully embraced the idea, idea of digital is that the SOPs that are non-specific, they're generic SOPs that you could plug any technology into and it would still be okay. To me, that means you're not getting the value out of a technology. If every technology plugged in is doing the same thing, and why are you plugging? <coughs> why, why, are you, why are you choosing one technology over another? So um, what we're doing at KCR is ensuring that the life cycle of a clinical trial, life cycle of activities, is part of the, the digital world. So digital and the training of people and the SOPs are all tightly integrated to make sure that you know, we're, we're actually running in a digital way, not just uh, doing our jobs and go, oh, hold on a minute, I need to go and update that database system yeah. over there. Yeah. Oh, God, no, I hate doing that. It's not that, that it's part of day-to-day -day work of everyone, okay? Um, so that, that's it's a mindset change, but it's really important because it means that things like oversight and uh, transparency to a sponsor can be achieved because people are doing it. Yeah. This is their work, not, oh, they're <coughs> updating this thing that the sponsor might see because that's what they want to see it. Yeah. What the sponsor is seeing is actually what's happening. Yeah. Um, so it's effectively near real time. So there, there's a there's a, a big change there, and I think workflow-based systems help achieve that. Platforms that are integrated help deliver that. Um, and it's been very difficult before. Um, we've talked about it in the past, but it's been very difficult to do because the technology has not really helped achieve that problem. But, said, but you're putting the thinking way forward. I mean, I think the analogy I've drawn publicly is I feel like decentralized has become a bit like adaptive 20 years ago. Just because you put the word adaptive in your protocol title doesn't make it adaptive. Now I'm in conversations where the protocol's finished and now someone wants to say, how do I decentralize that? I, I don't like that thinking. Mm. It sounds like you and KCR are trying to almost bring that thinking back to the protocol as well. No, it's, it's a very good point. So, um, so, so KCR pride themselves on, on having a consulting organization that help author protocols with okay. the sponsors. Okay. Um, and that, that was actually, a, to be honest with you, that was one of the one of the the big draws for me to join KCR. You know, I went through the experience of you know developing a decentralized clinical trial platform, and then being impacted by sponsors throwing a protocol yeah. that had been previously written and trying to bid on that and trying to show value. Um, and it was very difficult because obviously the protocol was written not as a decentralized clinical yeah. trial protocol; it was written as more of a traditional one. Um, so, you know, I feel strongly that there are great opportunities. Um, so from the consultative perspective, you should be looking right, how can I best run this study? You know, what are the new opportunities that I have to run this study most effectively and apply that? Now, I'm not, you know, obviously there's the there's scientific part as well. I'm not talking <coughs> more yep. so from an operational perspective, there are new ways to do certain things. Um, you know, if you have patients that have serious conditions like, uh, like MSA, um, they're getting very ill through in the course of the study. Uh, we can't expect these patients to turn up at the investigator site as often as they did at the beginning of the study, yeah. or, or even if they need to turn up at the investigator site at the beginning of the study. Um, we should put in place mechanisms where it's like a toolkit saying, actually for that condition, for that therapeutic area, um, we can do something slightly differently. Yeah. It's like a toolkit, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Um, and the protocol authoring should reflect actually we have these tools, we have these opportunities, and to apply that in protocol to make sure we can then execute on it. The toolkit we develop should allow patients to make day-by-day -day decisions on how they participate. And we shouldn't be reinforcing visit four is done this <coughs> way, visit five is done this way. That's not real world. Mm. It might work for some studies. Mm. And I suppose you could argue it is a step forward. Mm. But to me, that isn't, that isn't moving towards the goal of what we're trying to do, mm. which is, almost day by day patient specific flexibility and i think that's where maybe if you don't mind we'll we'll take a leap um, and that is to kind of two other terms that i feel have been perhaps abused and i'd like to get your opinion on and that's site centricity and patient centricity 
Because I feel we've talked as an industry for a long time about being patient-centric, being site-centric. But actually the reality is, and, and you said it quite early on, we're still anchored in the past with a lot mm. of paper thinking. Mm. What's your thinking about what we could do to be more site-centric and patient-centric? I think listening to the sites, first of all, I mean, the sites have a voice. Um, the, the sites have some frustrations. Um, most sites will will accept what's given to them to some degree, their interest in the patient and the therapy and, and, and you know, doing a good job. Um, but that sometimes is at the cost of efficiency and doing things the right way. So I, I'd, I'd like us to be listening to the sites more and go, right, you know, what can we do better here, you know? Um, uh, and I'm sure that they would stick up their hand um, and say, no, this is not good enough. You know, using five systems is crazy. Why are we using five systems? Using systems that are not speaking to each other, that's crazy, we don't need to do that. Um, so I think some of these things, um, I think would help twist our arms to some degree to force us forward. You know, the fact that we're still using and um, you know, a large proportion of the systems that are still used in clinical trials are 20 plus years old. You don't see that in any other industry. Um, and I think the sites and the patients are a catalyst to maybe forcing change faster. Moving on to the patient side of things, you know, one of, one of the, the principal catalysts I've heard for decentralized clinical trials is, is you can't ask a patient to use five systems. You know, they'll go, no, okay. I'm not going to do five systems. I'll not take part in the clinical trial. If you say, right, here's, a, here's a, an app that's f user friendly and helps you, assist you in your clinical okay. trial, they'll go, that's fine. And that will change the paradigm a wee bit because I think they'll, you can't simply ask a patient to do stuff for you and not give them back something in return. So that will change, I think, some of the technology as well. I think that's critical. I'm glad you said it that way because <coughs> to me, it, I don't like the phrase gamification, but surely these apps can give patients back. I think mm. about diabetes patients. Yeah. Amalgamating that data and giving them a, a score or mm. almost a, you know, your investigators watching, your, your, your doctor mm. says, well done. Mm. Your doctor says, come and see me, there's a problem. That, that should be highly automated. I think one of the things you could potentially lose with a decentralized trial is the interaction that the patient might have with a study nurse. They might become friends, they you know, first name terms and that, and all of a sudden you're taking that away. No. Um, you're losing something. Um, so I think we need to, we maybe can't replicate exactly that, but we at least should recognize yeah. the patient for what they're doing. Um, and we should look at, when you look at a particular clinical trial, look at the different areas of burden mm -hmm. and say, right, for these different areas of burden, what are we doing? And again, it's a toolkit, you know. Um, in some trials, travel, you know, there might still have to be travel, so let's make sure that there's travel support. For, for these patients. Other times, maybe the uh, when you take your pills, when you take your drugs, um, P, that might be complicated. Maybe oh, I've got to take it three times a day, I've got to take a blue one, a red one. and a, So why don't we put that into say, right now it's time to take that blue pill at this particular time. So reminder management and uh, dispensing support, I think, is also valuable. To me, that's true patient centricity, true mm. site centricity. Um, you know, as an industry, we're worried about protocol deviations and violations, but surely we can make it easier mm. because as you say the technology is there I mean I was talking to someone earlier I haven't visited a bank in 10 years but I do all my yeah. banking I bought my house online mm. you know I can do major mm. regulated decisions and mm. actions I can do it all online yep. and yet we seem to be struggling and I think the technology is there mm. it's just now about changing I think our approach and I, I like the way you said it listening to the sites listening mm. to patients mm. I think we have to build technology from the ground up rather than just say, we've got yeah. this solution that works for pharma, mm. now let's go and stick it in the site and tell yeah. them to use it. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Mm. So I think it has to help the sites as well. So, so that's why I'm saying listen to the sites. So listen to the sites really from two perspectives. One is what's broken, yeah. right? Um, but also what could we do for you, yeah. right? Um, so sites are, are having to do these other things to execute a clinical trial, give them support. You know, make it easier for them. You know, it, it doesn't have to be made harder. You know, and I think sometimes we do make life harder for them just because that's got to be the way it is. You, know, you and I have a shared history in the world of data management, so I'd like to come back to that and just ask you, what's your vision, kind of for data management and technologies? What do you think we can do 
from a pure data perspective in the near term to make trial execution, data availability better? I, I think um, a more holistic definition of the data. So um, there's almost, we still think in silos of data. Um, when you're running a clinical trial, you're trying to gather your data. And I would like us to think um, of what data do we need in the clinical trial and what mechanisms do we need to capture that data and try to think together, right? And have this continuous loop of, right, we're doing this, we're capturing this, and then, and keep looping round to continue to have an idea. Now, the, the, the argument against sort of following this sort of approach is the user experience. It's difficult for uh, people to get their head around, you know, tables and columns and so on. Um, but if we can manifest some of the representation of data in a format, we can still do that. Um, so if a, a data manager is happy to look at listings, yeah, fine, manifest the definition of listing to this, or if it's a medical monitor is happier representing data in this way, give them the tools. To, so I think it's the manifestation of the definition of data, the metadata, uh, in the particular use case, I think will help achieve that. It's difficult, but I think it's achievable. So people, all the stakeholders will say, yep, that's the data I want, and yeah, I can see how you're, you're acquiring that data. Just a bit more transparency. And having it in a single place will make it a lot easier. Having it distributed, you can't even start. You know? yeah. we, can't, we can't even talk about it if it's a silo over there and a silo over there. It just doesn't start. So that's what I'd like to see. And you know, as I said before, simplification. You know, we, we need to try to make it easier for all parties. Yeah. Simplifying the whole process by giving each user an experience that matches what they're trying to do, mm. but from a common data set. So Correct. I think if we have a true platform view of every data point, mm -hmm. but you know, you're not forcing CRAs to look at data the way sites do or data mm -hmm. managers do, mm -hmm. and medical monitors aren't forced to look at a listing just because that's what Correct. we have. Yeah, yeah. They, u they interact with the mm -hmm. data, but they interact with the same data in a connected manner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I think is truly. No, I, I totally agree. And I think the old EDC had this fault in that people were thinking, oh, let's just present it on an ETRF, it's yeah. easy, right? Yeah. And they'll figure out, right? Um, and, and maybe some of the early days where uh, the, the coding the coding specialists, they were the sort of first rebels were saying, I don't want to, I'm not gonna look at an ECRF, I don't want that. Yeah. But maybe PV people as well, I don't want to look at an ECRF. Um, and they're right, there was a reason for that. Um, and we have to recognize that and say, yeah, it might go to the same place, but it doesn't need to manifest mm -hmm to you in the same way. Yeah. It can manifest to you in a useful way. Um, so I think it's this perception of what you're trying to do, what information are you trying to get to, what's the context of it, and therefore what tool are you going to be presented with to do your job. If legacy EDC continues to perform as it does, mm -hmm. how long do you think before we'll see it being used in the minority of studies? Hmm. I mean, uh, if you'd asked me that question 15 years ago, I would have given you the wrong answer because uh, I would have thought it would change before now. Um, but I think, I think the platform will start to deliver tangible results. I think that's the key thing. And if we can demonstrate to the point where, I mean, look, maybe I'll give you a specific. So when a sponsor can go into a dashboard and see exactly what's happening or for across their studies, on a new real-time basis. That's going to be where they're going to go, I always want that, yeah. right? Yeah. And now, the reason that's achievable is for all the other things that's happening downstream. Right? You just can't get that yeah. sort of throughput if you've got disconnected systems that have to be checked and QC'd yeah. and things like that. So I think that will be the change, is the manifestation of real-time information. Um, um, and you, maybe one other thing on that is, is we talked about adaptive clinical trials, you mentioned it. It was difficult to do adaptive clinical trials because the data wasn't consolidated easily yeah. enough. I think we may actually go back to adaptive clinical trials and adaptive biostats where you're saying up front, right, we're going to do this statistical assessment on the data and we're going to fill this cup up. When it cup comes up, up to that yeah. point, then we're going to make this branch. Yeah. And when it comes up to that point, we're going to make that branch. We couldn't do that really properly before. Yeah. And so it didn't really take off. But when you can start doing that, some of the studies where adaptive studies make sense are yeah. all of a sudden achievable and very quickly achievable. You know, is the scenario, if we could give you a magic wand 
Uh, if you could wave that magic wand, are there two things that you wish you could just stop doing uh, when you wake up in the morning? And are there two things you wish you could do that you can't do today? Um, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I would like us to get away from paper, which seems like a crazy thing, because yeah. I could probably have said the same thing 20 years ago. But there's still too much paper in the life cycle of clinical trial and I actually extend paper to being scanned images of paper. Yep. Right. I put Excel in there as well. Anything yeah. that like that. Because there's just far too much of yeah. it. I mean, it's a, it seems like a simple step, but the principle of having an electronic form replacing a Word document that's scanned, it seems like a complete no-brainer to yeah. me, but it's still not that common. There's still a lot of documents that people think, oh, because I've scanned it and I've got an image of it, a PDF, super duper, we're, we're digital and electronic. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. So I'd like to see this idea of a PDF is not um, a digital form. I would like to see digital forms uh, running across the life cycle because once you've got these digital forms, you can put them, you can use that data. Yeah. You know. Um, so that's one thing I, I would love to see. Um, I would like to see, I would like to see patients involved. You know, when I when I'm talking about patient centricity, I'm not really talking about patient centricity. I'm, I'm talking about having patients at the table from a from a technology and an involvement perspective. What tends to happen and has happened for many years is you have systems that support the sponsors, you have systems that support the sponsors and sites, and yeah, there's patients over there. We'll throw an ePro app at them. They should be all all around the table, all around the virtual table, so that all of the stakeholders, especially the patients, are sitting down in front of the same platform, you know, interacting on a real real time basis. The the onboarding of patients at the front end and the long term follow up patients at the back end, there's opportunities there, absolute opportunities. Um, you know, to me, if you're involved in a vaccine study for COVID, or you're involved in an oncology study. There's no reason why you cannot be involved in long-term follow-up, you know, um, uh, especially for vaccine trials. You know, generally, I think the reason why long-term follow-up hasn't been carried out on a more routine basis is the siloing. You'll have the drug development department and you'll have the marketing <laughs> department doing their phase four registries. I mean, maybe that's uh, silver simplification, but I still think there is a bit of that. And I think from a safety perspective, I'd like to see more of the sort of phase 3B studies automatically rolling on so that within the same environment, within the same technology environment, you're just saying, oh, we can continue on to do long-term follow-up within the same sort of data environment, if you know what I mean. And that's where you could bring common long-term follow-ups, hmm. where you know, similar therapeutic areas or similar indications can roll into one <coughs> long-term yeah. study if need be. And that would give you that long-term data view, mm. so totally agree. Yeah. And I think the regulators have an opportunity. You know, I think from a technical perspective, it can be done. Mm. But the regulator should be, be saying, right, OK, we'll give you conditional approval, but on the condition that you follow up these patients, the technology will say, actually, <laughs> we can do that today. Yeah. You know, we can just keep going. Yeah. When we're involved in a clinical trial, there's lots of stakeholders. We don't need to copy the data. Um, there's lots of stakeholders and we can all be involved in the life cycle of that trial. So I think it's a mindset change um, and it's uh, converting the old world where I had a system and I had my database and the CRO had their system and the CRO had their database. I think as we go forward, we'll say actually, we only need one trial in this database and there's different stakeholders, including the patients, playing their role to carry out this trial. So that's what I'd like to see. I think cloud systems will, uh, enable us to do that and then I think the 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 people who work with them will go actually yeah we, we can embrace that approach. Collaboration across users would be a fantastic thing. Yep.